the world's weather is getting wilder. You know, the Earth is a very violent place. There are all kinds of natural processes happening all the time. From terrifying tornadoes... I said, people are going to die today. ...to monster hurricanes. Nature's a beast. It'll come at you any way and every way it can. It was mind-blowing. It was unbelievable. And a life and death situation in a hailstorm... All I remember is beelining it towards that animal, grabbing it and getting it in the car. ...to fast-moving walls of ice... It's like a big snowball coming at you. As the world warms up, we hear first-hand accounts of people living through new extremes of weather. The flash floods right there! You're in the middle of this perfect storm of mud. You really have to focus on surviving. Oh my God, Starbucks just got blown over. We had passed the point of no return. And we reveal exclusive footage captured by people around the world. Call 911! So shelter from the storm and hunker down for the world's wildest weather. Coming up on World's Wildest Weather, a horrifying hailstorm batters Brisbane. It was just kind of still and you could see the clouds moving in and then it all hell broke loose. On the crest of record-breaking waves in Portugal. It was just like, bang, shock all the way up my back. And then I had the washing machine effect. But first, a bomb cyclone brings blizzards to Boston and terror on the high seas. To be in the middle of the ocean was the scariest part. There was nowhere to go. You had to stay on the ship. Oh, that's not good. Hull is a pretty little town with about 10,000 inhabitants in the American state of Massachusetts. It sits on a low-lying peninsula just to the east of Boston, which pokes out like a finger into the Atlantic Ocean. Local resident Tina Bongo really enjoys her seafront existence. I live on the bay. I love the ocean. is very therapeutic. It's beautiful. You wake up, the bay is right there. It's nice. But sea views can come at a price when the weather gets wild. And nobody knows that better than Bill Frazier, who's been with the Hull Fire Department for over 15 years. Surrounded by the ocean, we only touch the land in one little corner of the town, and we get all the joys and troubles that come with being near the ocean. <laughs> in the winter storm season, some parts of this exposed peninsula are prone to flooding. My neighborhood definitely has flooded in the past, but it's never been an issue of coming into the house. It'll creep up into the driveway, into my yard, but then it, you know, never really affects the house. So this is an area used to stormy weather, but the winter of 2017 and 18 was exceptional. The problem starts with the very cold air arriving into the United States in December 2017. Air came from the Arctic regions of North America and invaded all the way into the deep south. We're talking sub-freezing temperatures uh, in Fahrenheit, getting down into the single digits and sub-zero temperatures. There are freezing conditions along the whole of the eastern seaboard of the US, but this is nothing new to the hardy residents of the more northerly states. The weather was, as always, cold. I wasn't that concerned. Living in New England, I didn't really think about it or get too worried about it, but I was wrong. About 200 miles away in New York, Canadian student Lindsay DeRues is preparing for a trip to the Bahamas with friends and family. They sail on the Norwegian breakaway cruise liner from a frosty Manhattan on December the 29th, 2017, just as this harsh weather starts to bite. Because of the freezing cold, we were really keen to get onto the boat and get away from it all. We wanted to go to spend time in the Bahamas, but <laughs> it didn't go as planned. 
The Norwegian Breakaway is a vast luxury cruise ship holding nearly 4,000 passengers. It didn't feel like you're on a ship, uh, which is normally the case with cruise ships. You don't really feel the wave too much. It feels like you're in some kind of fancy hotel, really. The holiday begins well. It was warm in the Bahamas, and we didn't really know there was a big storm coming at that point. As Lindsay holidays in the Bahamas early in the new year, a deep depression off the coast of Florida is brewing up serious weather problems as it tracks north. The center of this low pressure system was able to tap into all the moisture of the open Atlantic. Weather experts raise the alarm as they watch this massive storm power up the east coast of America. Forecasts were coming in and being updated constantly. Every hour the forecast got worse and it got very, very bad, very, very quickly. The situation becomes critical when the warm, moist air from the Atlantic collides with the very cold air from the Arctic. The pressure drop happened because you had a big discrepancy between the warmer air over the water and the very cold, dry air over land. So that created that, that difference in pressure and therefore the deepening that resulted in that low pressure system. The extreme temperature variation between the two different air masses triggers a sudden, dramatic drop of pressure. Weather experts call this a bomb cyclone. By definition, a bomb requires that it drop 24 millibars in 24 hours. This one did way more than that. It went 59 millibars in a day. Some people might call it a super bomb. It was a historic storm to have that kind of rapid deepening in such a short amount of time. What happens when you have a greater pressure change is that you get stronger winds. Bigger pressure change, stronger winds. These winds got up to 70, 80 miles per hour and, and higher in some cases. Back in Hull, Tina has a battle-hardened New England skepticism about alarming weather forecasts. What I remember, the meteorologist warning us about this bomb cyclone, I never heard of it before. So we were like, oh, you know, is this the news just trying to like get people excited and make a storyline? And no, <laughs> it was <laughs> the real thing. The first Lindsay knows of the growing storm is when a shore visit to a small island about 50 miles off the coast of Florida is called off. We were all prepared to go onto the island with all of our beach things and we were in line for about half an hour until they told us that the waves were too big so they cancelled the whole trip. The fact that we couldn't get onto the island was the first warning that something was coming up. No one really knew the extent of it at that time. A rare bomb cyclone is about to hit millions of people living on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And 4,000 hapless holidaymakers stranded at sea on a luxury cruise liner. A very low pressure system in warmer regions of the Atlantic can bring an additional threat, a hurricane. In this case, the low pressure in the atmosphere combines with the warm seas to create a rotating column of water-saturated air. Hurricanes can leave a tragic path of death and destruction in their wake as they rip through populated areas of the globe. So scientists like Lisa Bucci fly right into the heart of these deadly sea monsters to study them as they track across the planet. And their efforts can save countless lives when hurricanes make landfall. When I tell people that I fly into hurricanes, a lot of them are, think I'm crazy, they don't know why. And when they find out that I'm collecting data and transmitting it to them and there's no other way to get this data, then they're like, oh, good, we need that. Good for people like you. <laughs> In 2017, Lisa was one of the team tracking Hurricane Irma. Irma was a classic textbook formation. You get these groups of thunderstorms that form over Africa and they move off 
and become the initial disturbance that eventually became Irma. And so Irma formed just west of these islands, the Cape Verde Islands, and then quickly intensified into a major hurricane as it tracked westward. Irma develops off the coast of Africa on August the 30th, 2017, and powers towards continental America. Hurricanes are steered by upper level winds and there happened to be a particularly strong high pressure system over the Atlantic at that time. Normally hurricanes that form that far east would tend to curve north and not hit any land, but since that high pressure was so strong, it ended up tracking west into the Caribbean. As Irma approaches land, it develops into a massive hurricane and that brings it to the attention of veteran storm chaser, Josh Morgerman. Hurricane Irma was one of the greatest Atlantic hurricanes in many years. Uh, one, because it hit category five, which is the top of the intensity scale, but also because it stayed at category five, it maintained that intensity for a really long time. Josh heads to Naples, Florida to intercept Irma and hunkers down in a hotel room, waiting for the storm to make landfall as the hurricane was approaching. Uh, it's just rainy, windy weather, nothing too unusual. And that's, that's the funny thing. You know, if you didn't know a hurricane was coming, you just think, hmm, this is just some lousy weather, but then it starts to build and then it starts to get an edge. Lisa will experience her close encounter with Irma on a research flight, right into the heart of the hurricane. My emotions on the plane are like when you're on a, a roller coaster ride. You're a little bit excited and you're a little bit nervous but I'm passionate about getting the data to the people that need it. So flying into Irma was what I wanted to do. <laughs> we treat this plane like a flying laboratory. We have instruments on the plane that are taking measurements of the winds, the temperature, the moisture, the pressure, and we're radioing all that data back for hurricane forecast models. Back on land, Josh will also record Irma's vital statistics. But he's doing it at ground level by positioning himself right in the path of the incoming storm. Wind's getting a little crazy now. Some of the gusts are destructive. So Hurricane is a giant rotating windstorm. And as you get closer to the center, the winds get stronger. And the very strongest winds are in a tiny ring right around the center. And that's called the eye wall. And that's where the rain is heaviest and that's where the winds are strongest. That's where the scary stuff happens. As Irma approached Naples, I was watching it on radar and I could see that eye wall approaching the city. 10,000 feet up, Lisa enters the eye wall. accompanied by 20 researchers and flight staff on her P3 Orion. You're harnessed in and it can feel a lot like a roller coaster and in Irma it did. I was lifted out of my seat enough to feel the sensation of floating. You, you want to make sure everything is strapped down and you want to have a lid on your coffee. <laughs> but anyone caught in the eye wall 10,000 feet below has more to worry about than spilt drinks. Down on the ground, there are people that are experiencing these winds and they don't have the shelter of a nice, big, strong hurricane plane. So you're just hoping that they can stay safe. A lot of trees come in, branches smashing into cars, signs blowing around, and the worst is yet to come. That inner core is within probably an hour of here, but it's not here yet. I looked out across the fields near the hotel and I could just see this wall of rain and wind sweeping across the field toward the hotel. That was the eye wall. The inner core of Irma passed right over Naples. The wind just blew like crazy. The funny thing is every hurricane sounds different. Irma had a very whistly, very shrieky, very shrill sound. It was a harsh sounding hurricane. The violent eye wall rotates around a calm, clear section at the center of the hurricane. This is the eye of the storm. When you're flying into the eye, all of a sudden, the rain starts to stop, the clouds start to clear, and then you have a stadium of clouds around you. When I flew into Irma, the sun started to shine. We were flying in the eye for about 10 minutes, and all you see is just this giant wall of clouds. 
and it's pretty spectacular and a little bit terrifying. It's just after five o'clock. Wow, it calmed really suddenly. The pitch of the wind, that shrieky sound started to lower and that meant we were getting in the eye. It started to calm down. And then within a few minutes, it was dead calm outside. That was a ferocious onslaught from this storm. Wow, it's a very, very calm eye. Literally almost dead calm. It's a very quiet eye. It's so weird. After just like that, that pounding of the wind, to sort of experience that silence and that quiet is really weird. This region of the hurricane is clear and still because this is where the warm air, which has risen in the eye wall, drops back down to ground. In the eye of a hurricane, we have falling air. And as it falls, it warms and compresses and evaporates clouds, which is why you see clear skies in the eye of a hurricane. Generally, people were advised not to go outside during the eye of a hurricane. The reason is because the storm's only halfway over, and when those backside winds come rushing in, it can happen very fast, and it could happen so suddenly that you're not expecting it. It's 5.53, and it looks like the hurricane's picking up again. It looks like we're going back into it. When the opposite edge of the hurricane arrives, the wind changes direction and picks up speed again. As you're approaching the other side of the eye to head back into the eye wall, you get into your seat, you put your seatbelt on, and things start to get bouncier and rainier, and you're like, okay, I'm prepared, let's do this. <laughs> Lisa and the team were in the air for more than six hours, recording and documenting Hurricane Irma. When you're done with a mission, you feel relieved because you made it back. <laughs> because it is dangerous and you feel a sense of accomplishment for collecting the data and giving it to the people that need it. That's why I do this actually. <laughs> um, I fly into hurricanes because I want people to know what's happening to be prepared and to stay safe. Hurricane Irma caused at least 134 deaths, but the consequences could have been much worse without the warnings to people living in the path of the storm. When you're in a bad hurricane, it feels like it's something that's out to get you, but it's just a natural process. And unfortunately, when we are in the way or in the path of these processes, the consequences can be tragic. Collecting data inside these storms helps scientists, and that makes me feel really good. January 2018, a major storm system tracking up the east coast of the United States has collided with a cold air mass over the land to cause a sudden, dramatic drop in pressure, an event known as a bomb cyclone. When you think of a bomb, it's something that's quick, with high impact, that can be very destructive. That's exactly, in meteorology terms, what happens with a bomb cyclone. A luxury cruise liner, the Norwegian Breakaway, is heading home to New York after already experiencing bad weather on their last stop. Oversee closer to the center of this low pressure is where the strongest winds are going to be. And the ship, unfortunately, got caught in the path of this storm as it was going into that bomb cycle, rapid intensification. So that meant that within a period of 24 hours, what might have been a manageable storm to get through became a dangerous storm to be caught in the path of. Cruise ship veteran Lindsay DeRoos is on board the liner with her family. Whoa. The bomb cyclone drops in the middle of the night. I've never experienced a cruise ship being this uh, <laughs> rocky. So we decided to just kind of have a walk around and see what was going on. Oh, where did they go? We went down the stairs, we stepped into water and there was water coming down alongside the walls of the stairwell. There was water streaming out of the elevator shaft. There was a little atrium in the middle of the ship, which had water pouring over the top deck. Oh, that's not good. And 
loads of things were breaking <laughs> and loads of different the glasses were falling off shelves, uh, paintings were falling off the walls and people were just kind of freaking out everywhere. All the crew can do is to try to keep the passengers as safe as possible. The staff were amazing on, on the ship because they really tried to keep up with the cleaning and they were up all night uh, putting towels down everywhere to soak up a lot of the water. Lindsay's holiday cruise has become a terrifying journey into the unknown. We couldn't really access news <laughs> to, see, to see what was going on. The few people that did kind of spread the news that, oh, there's a bomb cyclone going on, which sounds horrible. I've never heard of a bomb cyclone before. <laughs> Um, so that was a bit terrifying. Outside, 30-foot waves are pounding the ship. We were all told to basically stay away from any windows and doors because it was so windy outside. You can hear the howling of the wind. But just to be in the middle of the ocean was the scariest part is because there was, there was nowhere to go. You had to stay on the ship. Back on land, the northwest of America is about to feel the full force of the bomb cyclone. As the storm was moving, it helped pull in another shot of Arctic deep cold air. And this one was even colder than the one that had settled into the region before the storm came in. I couldn't tell you the actual temperature, but it was biting. Um, it was biting. Any exposed skin was, was taking a beating. And as temperatures go below minus 20 degrees Celsius, wind speeds are rising. We just watch the wind gradually ramp up and ramp up and ramp up. High winds are a particular threat to coastal communities. With a rapid deepening, with pressure change, you're gonna get faster winds. Because in New England, there are a lot of residents that live right on the coast, they were susceptible to wind-driven water moving inland uh, into these populated areas at the same time that they were getting dumped on from above with very heavy snowfall. And when all this comes at the same time as a high tide, the elements are in place for serious problems for seaside residents, like Tina Bongo. Her home lies just yards from the ocean defences in Hull, Massachusetts. It's an old seawall, there's cracks, there's natural gaps, and usually when it floods, it just comes through the, the gaps. This time, the water was rising so high and quick, it was just pushing the water over the seawall. The precipitation, the snow, the freezing rain and sleet started, um, and it got to a point where the bay and the ocean just wanted to meet in the middle of the hull and just take it away. You could see the water just coming through the snow, like kind of underneath, it was really eerie, and coming further up towards the house. I still didn't think, though, that I was gonna have to worry about water coming in the house. A devastating combination of record tides Historic low temperatures and a massive bomb cyclone are set to wreak havoc on New England. November 2014. Brisbane, Australia. The Oztix software company, where Darren Woolsey and Owen Banks work, is based in the suburb of Wollongabba. They've both been there for a while, so they've got used to the spring storms which regularly wash through Queensland in November. I can start off very normal and uh, then, you know, storms can just appear out of nowhere in the afternoon. And around that time of year, big storms come through. We get some pretty crazy weather. So they weren't too concerned when they heard the warnings of extreme weather on the 27th of November. Usually with the warnings, you take them with a grain of salt and you think, yeah, something uh, could come down, but uh, generally in your particular location, it'll go around you or you'll get missed. Uh, so probably wasn't too worried to begin with. Particularly 
as there was little evidence in the morning of what was to come. It was like a normal day. Um, we didn't think that there was going to be um, too big of a, a storm. It was partially cloudy, but nothing to, to seem like it was going to be a big stormy day. But the clouds become increasingly ominous as the hours pass. I remember seeing the dark skies, and that was probably around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. My desk is, looks out over the big bay windows downstairs, and you could kind of see this dark cloud coming in. Over at the University of Queensland, Professor Hamish McGowan is tracking the weather system as it approaches the city. Well, I suppose we realised that we had a quite unusual storm on our hands um, probably mid-afternoon. The thing that struck me was the depth of the approaching storm front. It appeared to be unusually severe. This is big dark cloud just rolled in. It just seemed to have this weird greenish tinge to it. The green light is an indication that there is a lot of water within the body of the storm. The green tinge in storm clouds is associated with the scattering of light as it passes through the precipitation shaft within the thunderstorm. This saturated supercell storm moves ominously towards the city. We could see the cloud in the distance and while it looked big, it just came at us quite quickly. Um, that was when the winds picked up and you know, everything got really crazy. There was an observation come through about eight to ten minutes before the storm front actually hit the city itself, indicating a wind speed gust of close to 140, 145 kilometres an hour. And once we saw that, uh, there was no question that we were in for one hell of a ride. Dark clouds are gathering over Queensland. Brisbane is about to be hit by the largest storm in three decades. The 4th of January, 2018. A bomb cyclone has exploded over the east coast of America. The sudden, dramatic drop in pressure has produced wind speeds of over 120 miles an hour and waves of over 30 feet. Oh, God. The cruise liner, Norwegian Breakaway, was hit by the full force of the storm in the night. The next morning, we saw the extent of the damage. Uh, there were doors broken. The ship lost a lot of glasses and uh, anything that was on the shelves was most likely broken. We were just sitting by the windows watching in awe because you don't really see waves that big that often in the middle of the ocean, so it was incredible to see. But everyone made it through the night. That's when we started feeling like, OK, we're going to make it. <laughs> we'll make it back to New York. On land in Massachusetts, Temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees centigrade are hampering the rescue efforts of the emergency services. There may be a fire inside a house that we're trying to put out, but as the water is sprayed, if it's that cold, just the mist from the hose streams can build up and form ice very, very quickly on balconies, windows, sidings, roofs. And even experienced officers are witnessing conditions that they have never seen before. The ice flowing down the streets was something new for a lot of us. Things you take for granted, things that you can do during normal good weather days, you just can't do in situations like that. You know, you have to improvise, adapt and overcome, I guess. In the low-lying peninsula of Hull, Tina Bongo is watching an unstoppable river of ice surge towards her home. You can just see the water just rushing at like a, a, a good clip. And I was like, this is different. <laughs> this isn't what I'm used to. I saw the water just coming through the floorboards and through the bottom of the back door. And so I just ran upstairs and watched the snow like being pushed along. One of her neighbors, Jen Olivieri, arrives at the end of the street and starts filming the snowy scenes unfolding in front of her. As I was sitting there, 
in my car wondering what I should do next since I couldn't get home. I watched this woman step out of her house and walk across the water and it was way steep. And that's the first time I realized how deep the water actually was. The layer of snow is hiding dangerous flood water beneath and spending any time in this icy environment without protective clothes could be lethal. That's when I decided to call 911 and the dispatcher was amazing. He was very patient, had me describe everything to him. So he said, I can have the fire department come to your house. One of the fire trucks tried to come down the street, but it was too deep for the truck itself to come down. But the fire department had come up with a novel solution. The person couldn't exit their home because they weren't dressed to go through the water. So the safest thing we thought to do at the time was to, to get, keep them dry, get them out of their home. Um, we ended up using heavy equipment to do that. As we were waiting there, our um, highway department came with a front loader, and I wasn't sure what was happening. I had no idea. But it was a great idea. It worked. That's when I saw the, the bucket coming up to the window. It's amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Pulled right up to her house and I laughed and I filmed it. I laughed very hard. It was very funny. Kind of like taking steps and I think I crouched down to be on the safe side. It got in the bucket that way. And I was like, okay, I'm in good hands. This actually looks like it could be kind of fun. And it was. The front loader delivered Tina to a neighbor's house, where she warmed up as they switched on the television to find out more about the storm. And a few minutes later, literally it seemed like a few minutes later, I, they had the news on and you saw the rescue on the news. And it just played all day on all the channels, all day. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> a couple of days later, the Norwegian breakaway finally docks at a frosty Manhattan terminal. Getting our feet on the ground in New York was, was such a relief um, because we've been wobbling at sea for about two days, but also it was really cold. <laughs> so we got off the ship and now we're just gonna race to the car because it, is, it was very, very cold. I mean, it was a thrilling but scary experience. Uh, I'm glad we all got through it okay. It was just a, a crazy time. <laughs> Over in Massachusetts, Tina is back in her old house. And despite her experiences, has no plans to leave Hull anytime soon. People have asked, doesn't this make you want to move? No. I'm hoping that we don't get this again, but um, no, I, I couldn't imagine moving because of that. It's just, it's a great neighborhood, it's a great town, and I love living near the water. A massive supercell thunderstorm is bearing down on the city of Brisbane in southeast Australia. Darren Wolsey is out on the first floor deck of his company office building when he first realizes that there's a problem. It was just kind of still and you could see the clouds moving in and then all hell broke loose all at once really. I heard this uh, loud bang. It sounded like someone had thrown like a brick on the roof of the building. And that's when I thought, I think something's happening here. <laughs> I headed inside and the chaos started to unfold. Darren rushes down to the main work area and joins his colleague, Owen Banks. All these windows were just getting pummeled by hail. The wind came all the way through into about here. It was yeah. point insane. Pretty much right here, you're getting hit by bouncing hail. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I grabbed my camera and started filming from over there. Oh, no. 
Once the windows had smashed, they just opened up, you know, a big gaping hole where the stones were actually coming in. And that's where I thought, you know, this could get pretty crazy because the stones were quite large. At one point, hail probably the size of a cricket ball kind of bounced through to the room, basically where we're standing. Brisbane is being pounded by hailstones. And those hailstones are getting bigger. This needs a strong updraft to push water into the higher, colder areas of the storm and build the hailstones up to a terrifying size before they fall to the ground. The storm is, was exceptional. The strength of the updrafts were phenomenal. Um, you can imagine that. You know, you have a hailstone the size of your fist um, weighing uh, many, many grams that needs to be lifted thousands of metres into the atmosphere until it grows sufficiently to drop out. So you could have had vertical velocities in that storm around 180 kilometres an hour. The storm has high vertical winds pushing the hail back up into the freezing upper levels. But it also has intense horizontal winds. Oh my God! Blasting the hailstones into buildings and cars. The hail seemed to be coming through almost horizontally, so I'm guessing the wind was quite strong. Horizontal winds of 140 kilometres an hour are measured on the ground. That wind gust was associated with outflow from the base of the storm, so very cold, dense, heavy air descending rapidly through the storm, impacting the ground and then radiating out ahead of the storm itself, producing a cold air pool surging ahead of the storm. Back at Oztex, the storm is blowing a gale right through the office. The wind during the storm was very, very intense. Um, as you can see in the video, when my boss Smash was putting the table up against the windows, you can actually see the wind and how powerful it was. <laughs> then the lights really went out on Brisbane, or on Oztex anyway. We were hiding from the wind in here. Um, but what started to happen was it got so heavy, the rain, that it filled up this light well and just started to drip through. And that's where the lights started flickering. And it wasn't long before that, the lights went dark. But that just made the whole office go a whole nother level of intense. Because, yeah, girls were a bit scared. The boys were, like, running around like crazy. And just, the, you know, the office was, was going crazy at that time. And then, as quickly as the hail had begun, it stopped. Yeah, it felt like a long time, but it was probably over within five minutes or so. I think people were fairly shocked. What the hell just happened is basically what we said to each other. The residents of Brisbane emerged to discover that their city had been trashed. The storm injured 39 people, wrecked over 50,000 cars, and caused over a billion Australian dollars worth of damage. Andrew Cotton has been surfing for more than three decades. Originally from Devon, in the southwest of England, he now travels the world in search of the perfect wave. I've been surfing since I was probably like seven or eight. My dad took me to the local beach. We rented a board and a wetsuit, and it was just like, just loved it. He's part of a small group of international surfers who spend their lives waiting for the perfect combination of weather and geography to produce record-breaking waves. You hunt for the books waves in the world, which involves being geeky, looking at weather maps and storms and working out where the best conditions, the biggest waves are going to be. That takes Andrew and the other high rollers to one particular spot over any other. The west coast of Portugal in the old fishing village of Nazaré. Pretty much has the biggest waves in the world. 
The huge waves on this seaboard form as a result of major storm systems far out in the ocean. To have large waves in the west coast of Portugal, we need to have a low pressure system uh, in the Atlantic with the minimum pressure very low. Uh, and in the south border of this low, you have um, very intense winds. The winds whipped up by this low pressure system create big waves which spread across the ocean. Picture the Atlantic as a, a small pond. If you drop the, a pebble in, and you get that ripple effect that the waves sort of come out through the whole Atlantic. And the greater the distance travelled by the waves, or the fetch, as it is known, the bigger the waves can grow. The waves are increasing along the way, so they are increasing uh, as they move towards our coast. So the fetch needs to be very large, so you're talking about hundreds of kilometres in order to create these very large waves here. Waves generated by large storms in the Atlantic can travel up to 3,000 miles to the coast of Portugal. But the reason why Nazaré in particular breaks records for wave height is because it also has the largest underwater ravine in Europe. Nazaré is quite a, a magical place to surf because it has a really deep canyon that comes really close to the beach. Joe Vitorino of the Portuguese Hydrographic Institute has been studying the Nazaré Canyon for more than a decade. The canyon is like a valley that uh, starts in the uh, very deep ocean, so uh, more or less at 200 kilometers offshore. That uh, goes to very, very close to the, to the shore. As the swell approaches the coast, the section of the wave moving into the shallower water is slowed down by the seabed, while the section travelling over the canyon continues at the same speed. The faster wave above the canyon then converges with a slower section of wave to produce a wave which can be almost twice the size of the original. So there is a, a positive interaction of these two parts of the wave, and so the wave height is, uh, is increasing. This can double the size of the wave at the end of the canyon, which lies just a couple of hundred metres from the shore. You just get these crazy TP waves, which can be two times bigger than anywhere in Europe on that same swell, sometimes bigger. The 8th of November, 2017. A major storm in the North Atlantic is generating large waves, which travel thousands of miles to the coast of Portugal and arrive at Nazaré at exactly the right angle to maximize the amplification effect of the canyon. It was one of the days which could throw up some of the biggest waves of the year, if not ever. And that's one of the days which is worth putting everything on the line because you never know that like you might get that wave you've been dreaming of. The big wave hunters convene at the harbour at first light and everything seems to be falling into place. The, the conditions were, were great. The swell was due to peak at about midday. We got in the water at about eight o'clock. Um, it was magical, really. There is also a high pressure system over Nazare so there is very little wind to disrupt the waves as they approach the shore. When the waves arrive, you just want nice, calm conditions, light winds. It makes it easier to surf. It's like dream conditions. Andrew heads out to sea in search of the perfect wave. Weather pattern doesn't happen that often. You can wait years for a storm like this. It's exciting stuff, but you know maybe there's a bit of anxiety in the air, you know, there's a bit of fear. After a few successful runs, Andrew thinks he spots something special. Th this particular wave came from a canyon, and they can be in really good shape, really, really like hollow, lovely to surf. For any surfer, you know, the dream is to, to ride in the barrel, you know. And this, this wave looked like it was going to be the perfect barrel. Andrew gets into position, but his dream is about to become a nightmare. And I wanted to come up and then ride inside the barrel. But then the wave went from the best looking wave 
I could have imagined to the worst way in a split second. I've committed so heavily to be inside the barrel and the, the wave changed and I had nowhere to go. And then all of a sudden it was just like, bang! I jumped off the board and then I was just weightless. And then I had washing machine effect and then I was like getting all thrown around and ragdolled. I was in a lot of pain, probably a little bit, was maybe a bit shocked by now. As Andrew struggles to right himself, he is hit by a second monster wave. Fellow surfer Hugo Val attempts to tow him to safety on a jet ski, but then another wave smashes into them. Hugo isn't hurt, but Andrew takes another battering. Got hit by a wave and the jet ski rolled and I fell off, and then I was just floating around at about 20 feet from the beach. And I got washed up the beach, and, um, and the lifeguards were there. And I, and I, was, I was in the hospital within, within an hour, having been x-rayed and sort of, you know, waiting for my results. Andrew had broken his back, but there was no nerve damage, so the prognosis was good. I couldn't move and I couldn't, couldn't stand up at that point, but there was no worry, as in, like, I knew I would be able to move in the future. Um, it's just I couldn't move right then. He's now been working his way back to full fitness for nine months. Uh, I already started looking at the weather charts and, and sort of get excited for, for the next, next big wave. A matter of hours after Andrew's accident, Rodrigo Kosha entered the Guinness Book of Records when he successfully surfed an 80-foot wave at Nazare. I had the feeling that one of those waves were going to come through that day. So, you know, you're gutted that you missed that opportunity. But then also, like, like, I'm stoked for Rodrigo. I think it's great. I'm just waiting for my turn. It's all about peaking at the right time. And, then, and unfortunately, I sort of peaked a little bit too early. Ha, ha, ha.